So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming tonight to the Art Talk with Christopher. Uh, before we get started here at the Rotary Center for the Arts or in my basement in Kelowna, we are situated on the unceded and traditional territory of the Silak Okanagan people. Um, very grateful to live, play and work here. Uh, for those of you who do not know Christopher, Christopher is a writer, director, actor, dramaturge, teacher, etc. He's a graduate of the Playhouse Acting School and has played on stages in Europe and Canada. He's a founding member and past artistic associate of Bard on the Beach. Christopher has written several plays, including the adaptation of Gulliver's Travels for Kaleidoscope Theatre and also False Work, which he recently directed at the Canadian College of Performing Arts, which is an adaptation of a book of poetry by Gary Geddes. He's received two NCRC awards, including Best Current Affairs Program in 2017 for the Charles Campbell story. He's also received the Edmund Keene Award from Bard on the Beach for Lifetime Achievement, and is the founder and owner of Shake Scenes, in which he teaches acting workshops across the country. I know many of us in this room have attended and um, benefited greatly from those. Um, and Christopher has also taught at the Canadian College of Performing Arts since 2000. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Christopher and uh, take, you can take it away. <laughs> thank, thank you, Alana. And uh, thank, I'd like to thank all of you for, for joining us tonight. Uh, I want to talk about my relationship with uh, the process of adaptation, which is one of the things I do uh, as a theater professional. Uh, and I'll start by addressing just who I am and, and my history as a storyteller, as a theater artist. Uh, I've been working in the theater since uh, the late 80s, since 1989. I've been working for 35 years in the theater as uh, an actor, uh, director, and acting coach, and a, a playwright, a sound designer, and a dramaturg. And I always urge my, my students, uh, I teach in Victoria, uh, to learn how to wear um, a few hats comfortably in this field. Um, if you have any interest in, 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 in uh, sound design, do it, learn it. Um, it's another thing that you can do in this really, in this highly competitive uh, community that is uh, the Canadian theater. So it's really Im important to, 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 you know, indulge all of your interests uh, because it makes you, you know, much more employable as I'm sure all of you know. Uh, 35 years as a, as a theater, artist. I trained at the Vancouver Playhouse Acting School and there um, <clears throat> I had the good fortune to meet uh, Leo von Luke, a fiery Welshman who was our dramaturg and ta taught us play building. So uh, I had <clears throat> written plays before that but I had never really um, um, looked at dramatic structure or um, play building with uh, a great deal of uh, of uh, uh, detail or care. And that was Leofen, Leofen's great skill. Uh, he, he taught us to look at um, four um, uh, uh, elements of drama, which he, he described as time. How, how is the storyteller dealing with time? How is the, um, what is the uh, space? Um, how does the space, um, uh, interact and, 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 and impinge, uh, change the behaviors of the characters that uh, are there in, in the theatrical space, that, the, the wear of the piece. What's happening on the surface of, of the event? There could be an argument that's related to um, um, a, you know, a, a murder that has occurred before the, the play began, the, the, the the patricide or the, the mur uh, uncle's murder of a, of, a, of a father as we have in Hamlet. So that event is hugely important to the overall story. So time, space, surface, event. I've been looking at storytelling, um, you know, keeping those four um, 
elements in mind uh, as long as I, you know, work, uh, worked with Leo Fund, and he was a huge influence on my work, both as a director and as a writer. I also had the good fortune to work with Margaret Hollingsworth, who uh, the playwright who wrote Ever Loving and War Babies, uh, the house, house that Jack built. She was uh, a great uh, uh, helpmate and, and, and champion of, of my early work. And, and uh, I learned a great deal from her. And we also at the Playhouse uh, studied with Frank Moore who uh, wrote The Third Ascent and Big Baby, and I think now lives on, on the island and continues to write. Another uh, really wonderful writer who, who uh, <clears throat> taught me a lot about um, dialogue and, and uh, the, the creative process and the, how the playwright approaches uh, rehearsal and learns from the rehearsal process and the workshop process. One of the questions that was asked, uh, uh, that Alana put to me as I was, you know, putting together this talk was, how do the roles you play influence your work, including how you approach your work? And I think I consider myself first and foremost an actor, a storyteller, and those uh, that storytelling fixation, that storytelling uh, passion. Uh, has influenced all aspects of my work in the theater as a sound designer, as a director, uh, as a uh, as a dramaturg. That uh, we are, you know, we are storytellers at heart. We we are attempting to, uh, uh, you know, kind of enliven fables, you know, uh, and uh, tell stories that that uh, you know that hopefully are transformative that that change people that uh, and that that's been my that's been my goal uh, as long as I've been working in the theater that I believe in the transformative power of, of theater uh, what have been some challenges to my work as an adapter as a theater artist uh, what have been some challenges to me and, and my process uh, through this debacle, this plague, this COVID time that we've all been dealing with. I feel for all of you, every time I, I meet another actor in a coaching situation or uh, <clears throat> online talking about their projects, uh, there, there's tremendous uh, a sense of uh, a great longing to get back to that communal event, to get back into the room with other actors, to rehearse again, to tell stories to groups of strangers. Uh, that longing is is incredibly keen, and will be with us <laughs> as long as this uh, as as long as this pause uh, lasts. I have, like a lot of you, more spare time than I've ever had uh, in my career. And that spare time has led me to look at, uh, and kind of rethink what I, what do I want to, what do I want to be doing in the next few years? Um, what have, what's been left undone <clears throat> that I would like to do <clears throat> in the theater? And so, <clears throat> excuse me, projects, new, um, projects have come to the fore that I wouldn't have otherwise considered if I didn't have this abundance of extra time. <clears throat> now, how to use it? Um, I'm trying to, uh, to get into a, a, a more uh, consistent uh, um, routine with, with my writing, with my, my, uh, my theatrical uh, plans for, for the, th uh, the future when things open up. And, and that, has, that has worked reasonably well. Um, so the, the, the time has been incredibly challenging, but I've been looking for other outlets, looking for other options. Uh, the other, I, I just came from teaching in uh, Victoria and we uh, at CCPA, uh, where I've taught for the last 22 years, are unique in the country in that there are only 20, uh, there are only, we're one of 20%, um, part of the 20% uh, training colleges that are actually doing it uh, in situ with actors in the same room, masked and socially distanced. 
but in the same room. Uh, so we have rehearsed new plays. We've shared plays in performance with um, the, the, the college cohort, you know, small audiences of 20 to 25 of, of college cohorts. And those productions have been streamed to audiences that might not otherwise have been exposed to um, the work of the college. So that's that's been a shift. Uh, we have you know people tuning in from from Australia, from Europe, that would not have otherwise witnessed uh, a CCPA show. So that that's a change. It it's not theater in the traditional sense. There are profound limitations to a socially distanced. Uh, play presentation. Uh, the characters uh, in this piece that uh, I directed were all masked. So there are limitations there. Um, demands on the actor that wouldn't otherwise be as, as pronounced. What do I do? How do I tell the story with my extremities? How do I um, act more fully? Use my, my full, uh, uh, you know, corporal presence and, and use it in the work. Uh, how do I get by without the use of my, you know, the lower part of my face? My mouths and are so expressive. So it comes comes down to how um, the the silhouette and the uh, uh, the how how the 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 body the the whole person tells the story, which is a great challenge, but a wonderful challenge for for young actors. Anxiety. Uh, in this, through this phase, through the uh, COVID time has been uh, dialed up. It's more of a, a, a challenge in, and intimacy, which we've been looking at very, very closely over the last th three or four years, uh, that kind of sudden intimacy that, that is needed in the rehearsal hall. That has been very difficult to, to, to find. Not impossible, uh, but uh, it's terribly fr frustrating for young performers to have to deal with the limitations of uh, a touchless environment, a place where they can only get um, six feet um, from, from the other uh, performers. So intimacy takes different forms. Um, we started to talk in our rehearsal of uh, false work about uh, COVID stylization, about uh, spatially distanced communication. And that was, uh, I think that was, it was useful to think of uh, uh, communication in those terms for the actors because it forced them to send their, their impulses, send their tactics across uh, through a larger area. Uh, they, the tactics, the impulses had to travel further uh, in the space. So I think that was, although it's a limitation the students are dealing with, uh, it, I think it helped them uh, tremendously in their training. So uh, the, the, the training was not lost. Uh, we, we, what we, we gained in, in, in other areas uh, in terms of the, the corporal nature of, of performance. So though it's been a very, very challenging time, it's been incredibly rewarding. And in many ways, I feel that this period COVID has, has robbed with one hand and given with the other that opportunities have presented themselves, have, have come up in my um, professional life that would not have otherwise uh, uh, presented themselves. And while other opportunities have gone away, I've lost directing jobs, I've lost acting jobs, but while that has happened, um, that's seven months ago, Gary Geddes, um, a, he's a, a, a poet, uh, lives on Theatre's Island right now, contacted me out of the blue to say, I, I hear you do uh, dramaturgy uh, work. Um, I have a play um, that I'd like you to help me with. Uh, so it was a play about the last days of, uh, uh, last days of the, the communist uh, leader Trotsky in, in takes place in Mexico City. So I worked with him on that piece. And that's when he reminded me of uh, <clears throat> the piece False Work, which was in my, <clears throat> in my, on my bookshelf. And 
something I'd read four years before and thought this would make an interesting theatrical piece. So out of that relationship, which uh, came out of the blue, came this new, um, these new po this new possibility, um, turning <clears throat> false work, the poem suite into a theatrical event. And so that opportunity, um, I doubt it would have uh, uh, come to me if uh, Gary had been, uh, uh, you know, not uh, uh, casting about for, for new opportunities in the, you know, in this odd, this strange time that is, uh, that is the, the, the COVID uh, pause. So that, that, was, <clears throat> that was wonderful. Again, this, these opportunities appeared while other opportunities were, were <clears throat> slipping away. Uh, <clears throat> so I've learned uh, through this challenging time that I think through COVID, my communication skills have been tested. And I think they've improved because with masks, with social distancing, we as theater communicators have to be so much more um, to the point, so much clearer uh, because, you know, the, 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 all we have is, is, you know, we have the voice to communicate. So inflection, intonation becomes enormously important both for the, the director and for and for, and for the, the performer receiving um, those corrections or notes. So it's been, uh, I think one of the things, one of the benefits of, of this COVID experience has been uh, an increase at, at, in, in communication skills. Like my com communication skills have improved. We are also, as I said before, asked to act with the whole body, masked and distanced. We ask ourselves, well, how, how does this character walk? How does this character use her, her arms, her fingers? Uh, what, you know, what story does her posture tell? So those, those choices um, and that exploration becomes enormously important. So I've also been through this COVID time absolutely uh, flabbergasted, infused, inspired by the intrepid spirit of actors, just their, their adaptability and their optimism has moved me. So that, that is one thing that, uh, that I will take away from this time when and if, when the theater's open again. Hopes for the future. Uh, one, the one certainty is that venues will continue, theater companies will tr continue to try to rehearse shows and those rehearsals will hopefully provide some much needed employment and, and uh, you know, uh, creative uh, possibilities for expression for actors and creative workers and, and, and designers in the theater. <clears throat> we will need um, more support from the private sector. Social distancing, we're told, will stay in place until at least the end of the summer, if not into the fall, if not, if not longer. So what this shift is going to have a decisive effect on whether shows are financially viable or not. Uh, when you think that we have to reduce the, 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 our viewing audience by 70% to make it uh, feasible, this is, this is a huge uh, shift. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna put up on the screen right now uh, a picture of the Berliner Ensemble. And that's as, as it exists uh, this week in preparation for distanced um, viewing, this is the number of chairs that they are allowed to uh, keep open for, for patrons. So, and this is a, you know, this is a 700 seat theater that will now seat uh, 200 patrons. So it's, 
going to be enormously difficult for, for the smaller and regional theater companies to, you know, uh, launch a, a, a potentially viable, financially viable season, season with these kinds of numbers, with, with you know, uh, seats, uh, with uh, spectators uh, reduced uh, considerably. So this is a, this is a concern. Uh, are we going to be looking for, uh, uh, is this going to affect the, uh, the kind of programming that happens? Will we return to safer uh, uh, productions, uh, co more, more co-productions, more, uh, uh, you know, what, how fragile will our coming back be? Will we be more risk averse as spectators, as actors, as artistic directors, uh, this is a this is a really important question. Uh, we know that many fifty seat theaters above bars, tiny theaters. That's where a lot of the the a house directors and players come from. They they start in small theaters and branch out into uh, <clears throat> larger ventures in theater film and TV. So this is going to have a, 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 a huge effect. Um, the paucity of, 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 of small theater options for actors and directors and writers and designers is going to be problematic. So we, we have to maintain, uh, we have to be diligent, we have to be uh, intrepid, we have to be creative and look for uh, new ways to Produce new ways to to um, uh, move back into uh, you know new ways of pulling you know people into this dark room of strangers. Uh, there's the dangers we 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 go dark uh, for uh, longer than any of us are comfortable doing. So uh, in in uh, the work of adaptation, uh, I have I started out. Um, I've done most of the writing that I've done has been uh, uh, work in this area. I've adapted uh, uh, a fantasy fiction piece of uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's called Tehanu for Kaleidoscope years ago, and that uh, toured uh, all over all over Canada. And uh, I also um, adapted for the same company, uh, Gulliver's Travels, which is an, an entirely different uh, uh, kind of venture satire uh, a period piece and we, I was working there with uh, a company of really gifted uh, commedia players and puppets so uh, incorporating puppets into the storytelling process became a you know really important aspect of, of the storytelling process uh, I've also adapted uh, a number of uh, Shakespearean plays uh, for Bard on the Beach I, I adapted uh, Henry VI parts one, two, and three, and turned it into a uh, uh, one full length play, uh, The War of the Roses, which was presented um, about a decade ago. And so Shakespeare taught me a lot about concision, about dramatic structure, about um, uh, dramatic variety. And, uh, you know, I learned a great deal from, you know, uh, adaptations uh, uh, of Shakespearean pieces. Uh, and most recently, I adapted uh, Gary Gede's uh, uh, poem suite, False Work. So this, this was unique in that um, the, the suite itself, uh, there, are, there are historical characters, survivors in the piece, but there are uh, all of the uh, characters that uh, perish, uh, the fallen in the suite are all unidentified. So it's uh, this, elegiac portrait of this time, the, the collapse of the uh, Second Narrows Bridge in 1958, the biggest industrial accident in Vancouver's uh, history, in fact, in, in Canada's history to the time, 18 workers died. And this, uh, this piece uh, uh, chronicled, um, you know, the, the disparate voices of, as they, you know, uh, led up to the, the creation of this monumental structure as they endured the, it, its collapse and as they mourned, as the survivors mourned. So it's as much a piece about the community 
uh, uh, the Vancouver community in, in the 50s as it is about uh, an industrial accident. So it presented, you know, wonderful challenges and just moving it from the, the world of uh, poetry to the world of the theater was, was uh, a really challenging and, and fascinating endeavor. So what, what I've, I've asked Alana to do here is I have two, um, uh, two different texts. The first text called Disbelief is the poem from the suite, uh, 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 Gary Getty's suite. So I'm gonna ask Alana to read that poem. And then uh, we're both going to read uh, the scene that the poem was uh, that arose from from this poem that is part of the uh, the adaptation false work. So, Alana, do you want to uh, read us disbelief from sure. Gary's Gary's book? Sure. Uh, bear with me, everyone. This is um, oh sure, at least um, it's a near cold read. So <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much for jumping in. <clears throat> To call me a mess would be a gross understatement. Life goes on, they said, as if I hadn't noticed. Go see Marcel Marceau, the French mime. It'll be good for you, my kids urged. A distraction, anything to make you laugh. The Georgia auditorium was packed. At least 1800 throbbing egos wanting to be stroked, lifted out of themselves. I laughed sure enough, hysterically. The shushing around us sounded like a fleet of steam irons. I visualized barbells crushing him to the stage, the sword he swallowed, the one with the hilt engraved in gold, and the park full of old fogies, a dog walker bending to scoop but brushing it instead. Into the bushes, I cheered him on to come first in the bicycle race, his big, his big French heart about to burst at the finish line. When he grew from fetus to childhood, old age and death, I wept openly. Nothing was lost on me, not a single gesture or facial expression. The twitch of an eyebrow, the curl of a painted lip sent me reeling. What's real? What's imagined? Boundaries had disappeared. I couldn't bear to watch his high wire tightrope act, so I waited in the lobby. The kids, embarrassed, said nothing. Me? Guilt, of course, at feeling better, briefly. For weeks, the faces were interchangeable in dreams. Cosmetics, the pale makeup, a death mask. I'd been close enough to see sweat fall from his nose on stage. Now he was making love to me. Marcel, I cried. Harold, semen drying on my belly. The sad white face of full moon above me. Solicitous, expressive in its silence the resounding silence of the grave. Great, thank you very, very much. Now I just, uh, I will um, read with you because this is a, a kind of a, a suite for voices through here. We have the characters Marina and Manon and then Manon takes over as she heads to, uh, goes about her evening going to a Marcel Marceau concert. So if we could start, Ilana, from Freckles' Halo Summer, at the top of the page. Sorry, that's, Mar that's Maria? M Mar Mar Marina and Manon in, okay. the, in the script version that I sent you earlier. Okay. Freckles, Halo, Halo summer. summer. Freckles, Freckles Halo, Halo summer. summer. Freckles. Halo, summer. Manon speaks. Me? Yes, please. To call me a wreck would be a gross understatement. Go see Marcel Marceau, the French mime. It'll be good for you. A distraction. Anything to make you laugh. It's the sounds of audience, orchestra tuning. Manon takes her seat. Drum roll. Marceau appears as weightlifter in the Georgia Auditorium. It erupts as the barbells overwhelm Bip, crushing him to the stage. Manon laughs, then the laughter builds maniacally, exaggerating sounds of shushing. I laughed sure enough. 
hysterically. The shushing around me sounded like a fleet of steam irons. There's applause, darkness. Marceau appears with banner, youth, maturity, old age and death. We hear Marceau's voice on the PA. Here is a silent story of man with such eternal and fleeting moments that he would like to say without words, time stands still. We see Bips, four ages of man as Manon speaks. When he grew from fetus to childhood, old age and death, I wept openly. Nothing was lost on me, not a single gesture or facial expression. The twitch of an eyebrow, the curl of a painted lip sent me reeling. What's real? What's imagined? Boundaries had disappeared. As Bip's silent story ends, the audience claps. He, reappear, he reappears as a typewrite walker. After a few moments, Manon, overwhelmed, runs to the lobby. Marcel fades. I couldn't bear to watch his high wire act. For weeks, the faces were interchangeable in dreams. Behind Manon, we see Pops, her husband, in white face. He's dead. Bip appears opposite. Bip and Pops make love to her. Manon. Cosmetics, the pale makeup of a death mask. I'd been close enough to see the sweat fall from his nose on stage. Now he was making love to me. Oh, Manon. Cherie, the lovemaking ends. Marcel, I cried. Harold, semen drying on my belly, the sad white face of a full moon above me, solicitous, expressive in its silence. Marcel fades, leaving Pop's white face looming above Manon. The resounding silence of the grave. Fade into dawn light. Young Marie, barefoot in the garden, attending to nasturtiums. So it gives you a sense of how, uh, how things shift um, and how things shifted from the, the poem itself um, uh, to a theatricalization, a, uh, a stage version of, of the poem. So I just want to touch on <clears throat> What I think is important in, in, in the process, moving from a piece which exists so beautifully on its own to a theatricalization of, of the piece. And <clears throat> what is, I think, <clears throat> more important than anything with adaptation, with, with a piece like Who Has Seen the Wind, which I'm adapting, uh, I started adapting this week, and I'm heavily into the research phase, you have 388 pages of a novel, which is uh, an almost perfect creation. So Elysian, the deliberate act of omitting something becomes enormously important to the piece. What, what, do, I, what do we keep? What's, uh, what, and what subplots do we dispense with? What, what would, W.O. Mitchell have considered um, <clears throat> the most potent, the most compelling, the most important thematically moments from his piece. So Elysian omitting what do we leave out becomes enormously important. With Gary's piece, with false work, pictures aside, you have 80, about 88 pages of text. In that text, some voices are named. Uh, they have they come from a particular historical figure. And in other cases, the, the, the voices are unnamed. So I, <clears throat> number one, I had to think of uh, this piece had to be expanded in some way, expanded um, uh, in terms of the physical theater telling uh, of the story, but also expanded in terms of giving names and theatrical life uh, to characters that were not named in the piece. So. Uh, it became uh, no less a uh, no less creative act than uh, the one I have in front of me with "Who Has Seen the Wind," but there were there were more gaps. There was more space to be filled. There was more um, physical storytelling to to be done uh, with with this piece. So losing subplots did not become an issue. Uh, we I began by combining and 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 uh, inventing characters. Uh, and trying to find um, a, a clear dramatic 
beginning, middle, and end to the, the stories of the different characters in false work. The, the steel workers themselves, uh, the steel workers who perished, the steel workers who lived on and dealt with, you know, uh, their own, with alcoholism or, or trauma or survivor's guilt. Uh, and also very, and very importantly, the community itself, how was the community affected? So I kept um, talking to the actors who were, you know, bringing this to life about other models that I was thinking of. I'm, I'm thinking of Our Town, which is really a, uh, uh, an evocation of a community, uh, not, uh, not, not, you know, just the story of a single family or a single hero or heroine. And also looking at, at plays like Under Milkwood as, as, as models for what we were striving to do with this um, Vancouver story. So the act of adaptation there was very, very different than the one uh, that is before me uh, uh, with uh, Who Has Seen the Wind. Uh, so that becomes enormously important. The, 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 the material itself, uh, <clears throat> I talked to Gary shortly after we opened last week, and he was quite thrilled with what he saw in the, the stream version sitting in his uh, living room in, on Thetis Island. And one of the things he said to me, and the, the, what allowed me to kind of release and breathe again, because I was very nervous about how he would, how, how he would receive it, was he said the word spirit. He said the spirit of the story has been honored. The spirit of the poems has been honored. And I'd made a lot of additions. I I'd, I'd invented new characters. I'd written <clears throat> uh, about 30% 30, 30 of the text was, was a material that I'd created for the theatrical version. And all of this sat really well with him because he felt that the, the spirit of the piece uh, had, been, had been honored. Uh, so that, that I think, for the for the uh, adapting artist becomes the most important thing. Am I honoring the spirit of the piece? I know from talking with um, <clears throat> Orr Mitchell, who gave uh, Brian uh, Miskew and I the rights to create a musical out of Who Has Seen the Wind, that W.O. Mitchell, who died in 1998, was not happy with uh, adaptations uh, uh, he was not happy with the film adaptation, not happy with other uh, treatments of other stories he had written, and had a really <clears throat> awful kind of uh, uh, introduction to, to that, that transformation, uh, the, the kind of Hollywood treatment of, of his work. And so I listened very, very closely to what Orm had to say about um, the piece and the themes of the piece. And now I'm starting to think, well, what I'm going back in my research and listening to a 45 minute adaptation that W.O. Mitchell wrote himself for the CBC. I'm listening to his uh, uh, reading on Audible, uh, which is a, a three hour reading of the play. So it's it's an abridged version. And look, I'm looking very, very carefully at what uh, W.O. chose to keep in. What, what did he, uh, decide, decide to keep what was most important thematically and uh, in terms of pure storytelling, what, what were the most important scenes in, in the novel to him? So that's, I will start with those, um, um, with, with that guidance and then continue to do uh, the, the research that I need to do to bring uh, this piece to life. Uh, my co-creator in this piece, uh, Brian Miskew is a former student of mine. He's a very gifted composer. He will be uh, uh, from Winnipeg writing the music and all of our meetings to this point have been uh, on Zoom <laughs> or, or over the phone. So it's all been kind of distance creation, which uh, we're all getting used to. Uh, and uh, he sent me a whole uh, uh, playlist of songs that he feels uh, uh, will will be uh, he'll be using as kind of touchstones as as inspiration for the music he wants to create for this piece and both of us will come to uh, try to come to some kind of agreement as to what that abridged that um, uh, condensed compressed version of the story needs to be uh, and 
This is different than a play, of course, a di different than a, a total theater event um, such as false work was. This is, this is a musical and of a Canadian classic and that has been, you know, sold more than a million copies in this country alone. So there's, there's a, uh, a responsibility that comes with uh, trying to lift it off the page and, and turn it into something it hasn't been before in, into, into a musical. So that, that's both a, you know, an exciting challenge, but daunting um, <clears throat> as well. So I wanted uh, right now just to put up on the screen uh, a grid that I have used for years and I use it to, um, when working with young playwrights, because uh, one of the things I do is, is dramaturgy and I, a bit of, uh, I'm a play doctor and I've worked with a number of, a number of former students and, and, and clients across the country. Uh, Joel Birnbaum, uh, right, I'm very proud to say is right now, uh, his verbatim piece about uh, the immigrant experience uh, in, in Canada is, is playing uh, at the Belfry until I think Sunday night. And there have been a number of, of students that have come through the college who are now uh, practitioners, who are now writing their own material, uh, writing their own plays. And that to me, that, that's a, a great, uh, 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 makes me very, very happy uh, when, when, that, when that happens. Uh, so you can check that out. I think it's it can still be streamed if it. Uh, I think it ends on Sunday. But uh, as we look, these are the kinds of uh, considerations uh, I uh, look at um, uh, as I'm moving through the the first days, the pre-writing phase of adaptation. I start with images. So, what are the most potent images? in uh, Who Has Seen the Wind? What are the most potent images in, in false work? The ones that just leap out at me. One of the things that, that came to us very early in the process because we rehearsed false work over about four months were, was how do we uh, show the collapse of a structure as indomitable, as large as the Second Narrows Bridge? And the way we decided to do that, I, I'm a huge fan of chair art. I, I've seen a number of chair installations over the years that 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 I I loved, and we decided to, you know, get all the chairs we could that every theater in, in Victoria bring them into the studio and use chairs to build uh, the bridge uh, through the work events and also use chairs in the stylized. Uh, collapse of the bridge and the chairs would be the only uh, uh, decor elements in terms of you know furniture uh, architectural pieces that could be moved on on the stage and that that became uh, was incredibly ambitious because it, it required an enormous amount of our rehearsal uh, time to choreograph the, the the movement of the chairs but it it, uh, it was an element that uh, I now want to write into the 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 production draft of false work because it worked, I uh, it worked so beautifully. So that's a, an image, the image of chairs, chairs collapsing, chairs piling up in this uh, open space. That uh, with slides, visuals uh, uh, from the time, some of them historical, some of them, uh, uh, you know, from, from uh, that would be there to support um, uh, the storytelling, uh, both abstract slides and historical slides. So those images from the time, images from the event itself, from the tragedy itself, uh, played a, a, a large part in, in the, uh, you know, helping to tell the story, help, helping to uh, uh, visualize and, 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 and put the audience in, in the event. At one point when the, the, the workers fall uh, the, the hundred feet to the water as when they struck the water, which, you know, they hit like, it's like hitting, striking concrete. They uh, went under the, uh, uh, went under the water and, and the, the slide, there was a, an animated slide of, of water that put the audience in that same drowning predicament as, as the players. So that was, that was, uh, 
those those elements were uh, were written into the story. Design elements became uh, really an important part of the storytelling process. So I just want to share you uh, share with you a few of those visuals right now. Just bear with me. While that's coming up, Christopher, there was a question. Um, I'm curious as well, would you be willing to share that uh, grid by any chance so that it could be shared with people? I will do that next. Yeah. Uh, as, as like a PDF, sorry. Um, after oh yeah, I, I'll share it with everybody that's uh, that's present. Yeah, I'm happy to send it out if I have people's emails. That's, uh, that's uh, happy to do that. Great, thank you. Anybody who would like it, um, if you if you send me um, your email in the chat, I'll compile it and send it to Christopher after the chat. Thanks, Christopher. Oh, you're welcome. So, are people seeing any images up on the screen? We can see. Yep. It. Mm -hmm. This is one of the um, inspirations for the uh, use of the chairs for uh, as the dominant decor element. Oops, that's for later. So uh, I'm just going to put the grid back up for us. So images um, are enormously important. Uh, I begin at this stage to make copious notes. Um, uh, I did for false work. I had a, a 70 page common book, which just had news articles, overheard voices from the time, uh, radio broadcasts, uh, broadcasts, um, my own uh, clustering and, 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 and imagery related to Gary's um, uh, voices, uh, what ifs, daydreaming aspects, all of this fills up anything's grist for the mill at, at, at this point. Then I start to craft um, biographies, uh, both real and imaginary, for, for the characters from the piece. With um, false work, that was a, a, a significant job because there were 32 characters that, were, that, that the audience meets over the course of the two hours and 15 minutes. With, with <clears throat> who has seen the wind, the job will be to decide who are the most important in 2021 given our present predilections, our obsessions, given where we are uh, as, as, as a country, politically, socially, that who survives, who, whose story we tell in a story that has um, a number of subplots becomes enormously important. So uh, we, we have to trim um, the, the uh, the cast size uh, considerably, so that's that's going to be a, a really um, a, one of the dip, one of the difficult uh, jobs in the early going. It's just deciding <coughs> which which folk do we keep, um, what plots um, are most important. And again, I go back to using W as O as a guide. Go back to the the, the elements of the story, the the scenes. Uh, from the story that he felt were most uh, crucial, most uh, compelling, most vital. Then we start looking at the that art um, <clears throat> from the period. Now I, I'm going to put this up here. Uh, when I was my, I have a history with the book "Who Has Seen the Wind" that goes back 50 years. Uh, when I was in grade seven, a young adolescent. Uh, our, our teacher, Mr. W, uh, read um, a version of, of, of the book that contained all these wonderful William Carolick uh, illustrations. There are about 15 of them in the piece, some of them color, some of them uh, kind of crosshatch kind of etchings. And they, were, uh, and they remain with me uh, as a vivid part of that, uh, uh, of receiving that story. 
also, I was at a point where um, my father, um, uh, when I was 12 years old, was dying in hospital. He survived, lived to well into his 90s, but at that time he was uh, had diverticulitis and was um, his his <clears throat> life was in jeopardy. So that theme, um, Brian O'Connell's uh, uh, the death, the, the the sickness and and subsequent death of his father loomed very large in the story for me. I was also I'd also just uh, transferred schools from a very sedate, um, uh, uh, well behaved school, Bird Edwards on the North Shore, to a brand new school, Arthur Hatton, which was incredibly rough, um, uh, and I was having an enormously hard time fitting in. So the character. The Ben, who's a an outsider, a, uh, a a figure that lives on the on the margins of that tiny community, which is Weyburn, uh, <clears throat> uh, became uh, uh, a kind of touchstone for me in in the story. We also it was one of the first instances of of pure um, storytelling that uh, a really good. Uh, uh, storytelling from someone I didn't expect uh, to receive it from, uh, Mr. W, our teacher, who was in the in the throes of a nervous breakdown trying to deal with this obstreperous, you know, this uh, tough group of students. And yet this was his best defense when he took out this book and read to us from the front of the class and, um, you know, uh, became all of those characters. He was a very skillful, skillful actor. The whole room uh, settled. Uh, there was a calm, and we all went, we wouldn't admit it, but we all looked forward to those story times. And he got into the habit of reading it, reading it to us right after lunch for an hour, uh, all through uh, all through the winter of, of seventy one. And that that to me was was uh, life changing. The book was enormously important to me, and to have. <clears throat> Um, the opportunity, uh, and it wasn't, I didn't seek out the opportunity, it was Brian Miskew in, in Winnipeg who, who secured the, 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 pos the, the chance for us. When this fell into my lap, I, I couldn't have been happier. So uh, the, these, as we look at images, I will be looking really carefully at Carolock's work, because Carolock illustrated a number of W. O. Mitchell's books over the years. So there, that becomes a uh, uh, an art uh, touchstone that that I'll be I will be looking at very very carefully as I research uh, this book. So I'll put the uh, grid back up for us. So images, notes, um, bios, art, and music. I want to play something for you here. Uh, I'm uh, just now beginning to uh, uh, go through Brian's playlist as the composer. He's sent me this whole raft of, of songs to listen to. But I want to play for you right now uh, something that we uh, I used in the early days of creating uh, False Work, the play. And we also used it in, in rehearsal for the, uh, uh, the warm ups and the, the character exploration work. Uh, Can everybody hear that? No. You can't no. hear that? No. No. <clears throat> well, I'll just describe some of the stuff. It's about a 20 minute uh, mashup of material. It starts with Jimmy Dean's Steel Men, which was actually written after the fall of the bridge, it became a, 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 a small country hit with it celebrated um, the the fallen steel workers but that that song steel men which is a kind of blues hauler in a way a kind of country blues hauler uh, in the in the uh, and finds uh, uh, reappears all the way through through the uh, the play in in different um, uh, settings and, and uh, as the mood of the piece shifts so uh, we use uh, 
po um, popular music. We used radio broadcast. I managed to secure um, a, um, I think it's a CKNW uh, report on the day uh, that the um, bridge collapsed. So uh, the, the characters in, in the, the White Lunch, which was a, a a uh, very exclusive whites only restaurant in, in on the downtown east side, uh, which we also evoke. They, they, um, that is the, the song that they were hearing on the radio. So, um, and there, there are other pieces that, um, uh, from uh, more contemporary music that was used for the uh, for the uh, building of the bridge for the collapse of the bridge. So these these themes uh, uh, became a really important uh, kind of background music for the creation of the piece and also for the uh, the actors work as they worked physically in, and and began to discover their their physical characters in rehearsal. So that was a, a, a an enormously useful tool. So um, art and music uh, figured figures largely in the in the nascent creation of, of uh, an adaptation. I start to um, look at titles. Seen, uh, I had a title which I really liked that Gary created for the piece, "False Work." Who was seen the wind? That wonderful um, uh, poem by Christina Rossetti that that uh, is serves as the title for W. O. Mitchell's piece. That that. Uh, that doesn't need to be changed. But one of the things I do to help focus the writing from scene to scene to scene is, is uh, by naming each each individual uh, each individual scene. And with Gary's work, some of some of the pieces uh, uh, were given the name of the actual uh, poem that they that 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 this uh, that inspired the scene. And in other cases, we focused on <coughs> an event or uh, uh, the uh, you know, tried to focus through the title on the, the crisis or event of that particular scene. Uh, so titles, when you're in the early days, uh, remember uh, the John Patrick Shanley uh, talking uh, about the creation of doubt. All he had in the early days of working on that Pulitzer Prize winner was the title, doubt. The concept of doubt. So sometimes a title can be can be an enormous gift and can uh, begin to uh, help the writer shape the entire piece thematically and structurally. Uh, <clears throat> with um, Gary's piece, with false work, the whole uh, issue of choices and change became enormously important because a poem can. Uh, at least from a dramatic perspective, uh, exist on the page as a kind of static entity, as something that doesn't seem to doesn't really move in a, in the way that a scene needs to move. We had I had to make adjustments and and challenge uh, uh, the poem, uh, try to try to pull out all of the the the, the possible um, uh, examples of dramatic action, and in some cases, and what I was looking at from the beginning was looking at making sure that all of the characters in the piece, because everybody appears um, has at least two scenes, some have two or three, uh, tracking their arc. How, how do they change over the course of the play from the building of the bridge, that wild enthusiasm uh, and uh, the kind of rush of uh, enterprise that, that, that seized all of them through the collapse, the, the, the tragedy of the collapse to the mourning period, which the, the entire second act is taken up with <clears throat> the, uh, the community, it occupies itself with the community's mourning. So I, as a dramatist, I have to make sure, poet doesn't have to worry about this as much, I have to make sure that there is growth, there is change, and, and there are tactics for the, the actor playing that character to, to, uh, to play. Uh, so choices and change become enormously important. I think W.O.'s piece is, um, <clears throat> the challenge with it is because, because that piece is about a boy's uh, <clears throat> musings, the mundane life of, uh, on a, a prairie farm in, the depression 30s uh, 
so there's a, not a great deal of dramatic action. It's broken up into four different parts. And those four different chapters, the four, four different sections are all connected to the death <clears throat> of some entity. First, we have the, the death of a rabbit. We have the death of uh, a dog. We have the death <clears throat> of <clears throat> Brian's father. And we have the death of his grandmother, who he, at the beginning of the piece, um, <clears throat> seems to despise and grows to um, love dearly <clears throat> by her death. So death <clears throat> um, is, uh, you know, a vivid character in this piece and, and death accompanies all of the shifts in this building's moment, this, this um, <clears throat> rite of passage uh, that um, <clears throat> Brian goes through from age four to age 12. So Although the film from 1977, Alan King's film, um, one of one of W.O.'s concerns, his his chief concern, was for financial reasons. They decided to to uh, limit the action of the film to two seasons. W.O. insisted in his treatment, which they didn't look at, on um, the entire <coughs> range of seasons, all four seasons, and all the stages of of Brian's life, which might have necessitated using a, a, a having a very young Brian and an adolescent Brian, but uh, that's not uh, uh, the way that the filmmakers wanted to go. So he was enormously disappointed that not only did he feel the the natural world, the meadowlarks, the wind itself, the prairie was not um, represented, um, uh, was not as as uh, uh, potent a part of the story uh, as it, it in the film as it is in the novel. So those, those elements are things that we're now going to want to uh, <clears throat> bring into the score, bring into the soundscape, bring into the <clears throat> design of, of the musical because it was enormously important to W.O. and, and W.O.'s uh, estate. So that's something we'll be looking at very, very carefully. Conflict. Uh, <clears throat> all of the conflict um, that emerges in W. O. Mitchell is internal, is largely internal conflict. There are skirmishes between he and his <clears throat> his schoolmates. There are skirmish, minor skirmishes between he, you know, kind of psychological scuffles with his parents and his his grandmother. But by and large, it is a <clears throat> a piece about the interior the rich interior life of this farm boy. So that will be a challenge that uh, is uh, markedly different than the challenge of adapting false work, <clears throat> which was you know, a play for voices. Uh, genre and style, uh, Gary's piece is a memory piece, false work. It, uh, it is, has a, um, elements of documentary um, that uh, it has elements of, of uh, <clears throat> the elegy, poetic elegy. And so it was very important uh, to me to honor um, the style of the piece. I'm still trying to um, grasp uh, the uh, W.O.'s uh, style in the piece, which is, uh, he's a great teller of yarns. Uh, he has a, a remarkable, uh, he had a remarkable uh, capacity for uh, capturing the, uh, uh, the, the young imagination and uh, uh, <clears throat> a wonderful uh, uh, ability of creating very, very credible dialogue. Um, uh, with, uh, amongst young people. So that, that, those are elements that we will, uh, we're going to want to honor because there's, it's a, it's a novel, unlike some novels, there is, uh, there are a lot of descriptive passages, but there's a, uh, an abundance of dialogue uh, to be, to be uh, plumbed in the piece. So that's, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's uh, that'll be uh, wonderfully uh, uh, rich uh, to, to mine that, mine that, that material. Uh, myth. Uh, I always uh, go back to Joseph Campbell and, and uh, 
look for the, the, the archetypes in the story and the fables that might be um, uh, being retold in, uh, in the piece with Who Has Seen the Wind. Uh, we have a, a kind of um, write a, a, a story which is about a, a coming of age, about uh, ch um, childhood rites of passage. Uh, in many ways, I think I think it, it's it's uh, a story about almost a Candide story about an, an innocent, um, <clears throat> a genuine innocent trying learning about the strange world he's been uh, <clears throat> he's being brought up in that he's been born into. So uh, looking for you know what, what myth is being retold here, what fables being retold here can be a really useful question for the adapter to ask herself, himself. Uh, my next job um, would be to, to create a sketch of the piece, a kind of treatment. Uh, I start with uh, what I call a, a, a one pager, which is uh, <clears throat> uh, putting, trying to distill the story into uh, a few paragraphs. And then from that sketch comes uh, a treatment, which may, may be as long as uh, 10 or 12 pages where I'm <clears throat> expanding it. That's where I start to uh, I find recipe cards enormously useful, particularly when you're dealing with uh, a, a, a bigger story that might contain uh, numerous subplots. Uh, you can buy these for about a dollar at the dollar store and they're color coded. So the, these uh, as, as a uh, way of beginning to craft a storyboard, uh, uh, file cards can be enormously useful. So every, every file card represents a, a, a one scene in the piece. I think David Lynch said at one point that if you can fill 70 recipe cards with 70 scenes, you've probably got enough material for a feature. I've heard other, <laughs> other figures quoted, but you know, for uh, you know, between fifty and seventy, and you've got uh, you've got a story that might uh, uh, fill fill a uh, uh, a fe uh, might be feature length. So this is a, a wonderful storyboarding technique that I start shortly after I've you know fleshed out a ten to twelve page treatment, which is what I'm involved in right now. And then once that's created, I start to look at the cast design. Who are the most useful um, people to, uh, to keep in, in this piece? What, where, where does the heat, where does the tension, where, does the, where, where um, are, the, uh, are the moments, of, uh, the, the high stakes moments of, of interaction? Where, where are the, the arguments and, and, and battles? Uh, John Guare once said that any play worth its salt starts with a good argument, the operative word being good. So where, look, I start to go, I'll be looking through the book for arguments, conflagrations uh, 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 that happen between characters and then consider, do I need to keep this part of the story? Do I have to need to, uh, to keep this plot and, and not the other? So cast design, how the characters um, uh, play off one to the other, um, how they, uh, what, what function um, do, they, do they fulfill in the piece uh, from a storytelling perspective? That becomes enormously important. I just want to uh, stop for a second um, for any questions that might have come up for people thus far. Are there any questions? Um, yes, uh, it's Steve here. I'm, I'm just trying to work out how to get my uh, image back, but I can't. I can hear you clearly, Stephen. Oh, okay, I'll work out how to get the image back. Um, just going right back to the beginning of your talk when you were talking about um, uh, rehearsing, mm -hmm. interested to know about, a little bit more about uh, how you managed rehearsing with, uh, you know, masks and COVID. Uh, was it, were your rehearsals all in uh, person? Or did you attempt to do any rehearsing by Zoom? Uh, and, uh, uh, and when it came to the masks, uh, you say uh, people were wearing masks in, in performance as well. They were. Um, it's, 
It's interesting. I'll, I'll start with that part uh, it, uh, of your question first and work backwards. That uh, I think Gary saw it twice, and, and he some of his um, colleagues and friends watched it on on closing after having seen it on opening. And one of the one of the uh, problems um, uh, he had with it was the what I would call the problem of the masks. And that in a in a play that has 30 plus characters, it's an enormous um, challenge for the actor to create distinctly different character bodies and, and mannerisms for characters that are masked. When you don't have access to the face um, and 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 the mouth, even though the character they were very, they were clearly heard and, and their diction was excellent, it does uh, can create confusion. So the masks made it harder for the spectators to connect both the spectators stream, watching the streamed version and uh, the people in the audience, the cohorts in the audience. It was harder for them to, to differentiate one character from the next. So that's a challenge that hopefully <clears throat> we won't have to face in a, in a maskless production of the piece. We all we did have to have a few Zoom rehearsals, not full Zoom rehearsals, but because of the, the nature of the, the, the agreement that you know if a person was feeling even a slight tickle in the throat, they were advised to stay home. So on occasion we we'd have people on camera that were watching and, and kind of feeding in or, or reading in their lines. Uh, but um, the the majority of the rehearsals were uh, we were in situ together in different studios of varying, varying sizes. So um, masked always and always respectful of that six foot distance. So um, we, the only time we challenged, uh, we, we, we pushed the, the, the limit with uh, 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 proximity um, and came closer than six feet was during the, the the bar fight and 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 in the moments of of uh, violence, which uh, could only be executed safely if the uh, if the characters were in, were in in contact, but fortunately we had people from the same cohort, some roommates that were involved in the in the in the fights that could get that close, but um, for the rest of the play we kept people at a at a safe distance and we always rehearsed together. Uh, does that answer your question, Stephen? Cool. Yes, it does. But I'm sure other people have got other questions. But with the masking during performance, I mean, you know, there's, you know, the uh, Commedia dell'arte where masks are used, although usually the face, the, the mouth is exposed. Mm -hmm. Could, did you consider somehow customi customizing the masks? <laughs> We had a very, very uh, gifted um, costume assistant, um, Haley Sabaran, uh, who's actually from uh, Cologne, maybe one or two of you that know her. Uh, and she uh, came up with these um, kind of tribal colors uh, for all of the different characters, like the, the steel workers had their own uh, uh, colored masks, the family members had their own colored masks, people that, that uh, worked in the community had different colors, and uh, we had kind of the company masks and the and the and the steel worker masks so that that uh, coding not unlike what you might do with you know uh, sashes or or flags in a, in a Shakespearean production that really helped um, the spectators differentiate one um, uh, community group from another so that 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 helped a lot and that was that was Haley's Haley's uh, innovation thanks thanks a lot it's great thank you Oh, great. Anyone else? Um, Stephen, I have a question. Um, is, that, is that okay? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I was wondering, do you think it's possible to adapt a work that you, there are components of it that you don't necessarily agree with? Um, for instance, I've, like my favorite novel, I've always loved it and I've always kind of dreamed of adapting it, but it is, uh, it's a Christian novel. And while that's like lovely um, for other people, it doesn't necessarily resonate with me, but I find the story very inspiring. <laughs> so I'm like, is it possible to reconcile that kind of difference in opinion or what have you when you're adapting something? That's a really good question, Elise. I, I wrestled 
with that issue in a much, much smaller way, working on false work. <clears throat> I'm working with the work, you know, uh, Gary is 82, a different generation than myself. Um, his, the world that he was writing about was a very, very masculine world. Um, uh, <clears throat> and there was, I, would, I won't say shades, but there were, there, overtones of, of not misogyny but about right the writing for the for the man was better than the writing for the women in my view so that was something that I that I took upon as a challenge and also the fact that when I did the math in 1958 queer people existed did you know that <laughs> yeah so in our version of it we said okay there are two people there has to be at least two or three people that are in, either in the closet or are <clears throat> you know, loud and proud, that which was very unusual, very um, rare at that time. So we decided that um, Delia, the consultant, um, was going to have <clears throat> um, was going to have a, a a big crush on the cabaret singer, and they would leave together. And also, there there's an un <clears throat> um, um, spoken. Uh, attraction relationship between um, two of the steel workers <clears throat> that's touched on. So those adjustments and also the bigger adjustment, I would say at least would be the, the structure of the second act, which really became about communal grief. So I think if the energy of the first act was hyper masculine, the energy of the second act was more feminine in that it was about um, <clears throat> um, coming to terms with loss uh, it, and some of the men did it expertly and others, you know, turned to the bottle. So you saw the fracturing that was happening amongst the surviving steel workers and the family, <clears throat> the, the widows dealing with it in a much, much different way. And that was really important to me that I, I, it wasn't really uh, a, a significant facet of the, of the poem suite. It's something that I wanted to bring to the piece. So my long answer to your to your question is that I would not rule out I don't think you have to be philosophically aligned um, or spiritually aligned with the piece to do a good job adapting it the first piece I was given to adapt was Tejano by Ursula K. Le Guin I was no great fan of fantasy fiction nor was I a great fan of Ursula K. Le Guin's I had to I had to learn to fall in love with her because I was hired I was a hired gun so that would be another instant where I say, okay, geez, this book's opaque to me, you know? So after 30 readings, I liked it a bit more, right? So I had to do that work to fall in love with Ursula K. Le Guin. So that would be cool. my, my answer. I think don't rule up, if there's something that, that inspires you, don't, don't uh, rule out the possibility of, of, of adapting it simply because it's philosophically at odds with your beliefs. Cool, thank you so much. Good, that's great. Great question. <laughs> so I just wanna continue going. It doesn't matter that we touch on all of them, but I just wanted to touch on a few more points of the grid. Um, this is up now or should be um, as I share it. News, oh, that's the, the formal one again. I'll, I'll bring it, bring the other one up. So third, uh, point of view becomes really important uh, that um, what <clears throat> are your hero's passions? Um, Brian O'Connell has this passion to know what life's about, to know what death is, who God is, why, why the wind, why he, why the wind, he can feel the wind, but not see the wind. Uh, so all of those, mis those mysteries, um, unanswerables perhaps and which remains elliptical and unanswered in the novel are the questions that that obsess him so his point of view is very very different than than the points of view of of the of the dominion bridge employee or the steel worker and it's it's a it's an innocent um uh and and uh you know uh refreshingly uh uh fresh uh, vision of the world so i want i want to honor that and, and really dive into Brian's um, very, very distinct, distinctive point of view. Setting, 
Um, Vancouver, one of the compliments I received uh, last week from the from the uh, premiere of the workshop production was that uh, one of my colleagues said that she felt that the piece was a love letter uh, or uh, to Vancouver or to Vancouver history. So I felt that the setting, um, Vancouver as a milieu, as a as an atmosphere, as as aware was um, well rendered in the piece. Uh, were she able to say, and I, I want to go even further with that, with the, with the subsequent pub, uh, production drafts that will will come. <clears throat> Knowing <clears throat> your hero or heroine, choosing a really good hero, a hero that is not passive, a hero that <clears throat> that changes, that morphs over the course of of the story, is enormously important. And W. O. Mitchell has has done a fine job with Brian in that way. He he. He goes through so many changes over the course of, <clears throat> of the, the four chapters um, of, of the piece. So that's, that will be, it'll be my fault if that, if that journey is not um, um, well, well represented and fully uh, fleshed out. Uh, scenes and sequences, the scene arrangement uh, with um, Gary's piece, we, um, in the in the first act, there were a couple of flashback scenes. We we start uh, that play with the lone surviving steel worker Lou Lessard, who still who is still alive, in his garden at um, at the end of the COVID memorial. So we we start in the present and move backwards because it's a memory play. So um, the the sequence order, the 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 mise en scene, the the how how the scenes were cut together what uh, became enormously important. There is a, a, a much more formal um, uh, structure that I, I will need to follow with Who Has Seen the Wind. It's, it's structured like a four act play. So I, I wanna honor that first before I change any of that. I think that the structure is very, very sound. With um, <clears throat> the, the, the material, the, the you know, uh, medium that I was working with, with false work allowed me to be a little freer with the um, um, order ordering of the scenes and the sequence of scenes. Uh, as in my view, a, a poem is already a subtextual event that there, there, it's a, a kind of inner, the dialogue of, of one's inner voices that's happening. Sometimes it reaches out to others or, or um, um, people are, um, you know, the, the, the speaker will try to contact someone who can't hear them, but subtext is what po poetry is all about. So that that was already in place. Um, in With false work, I had to actually work um, in an in inverse fashion in that saying what uh, physicality, what <clears throat> um, stage movement um, best suits the subtext of the poem best um, uh, evokes the the subtext of the poem so that the physical theater um, elements of, of the play became enormously important for kind of embodying the the subtext of of the different poems the quest in in who has seen the wind is an individual ch uh, 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 childish quest for knowledge uh, the quest in false work is is uh, very very different. It's it's really about a community. It's about a uh, community striving, uh, uh, c coming to maturity. Uh, about Vancouver kind of growing into itself as it did in the late fifties with all the the the, the, <clears throat> the building boom that was happening and and uh, you know amazing structures being erected. The BC Hydro building, which was you know this architectural marvel in the international style that was something brand new to Vancouver. The the bridge itself was uh, <clears throat> one of the biggest bridges being built. Uh, the Second Era was one of the biggest bridges being built in Canada at that time. So that um, the the thrill of that quest, um, <clears throat> iron workers being the creme de la creme of of 
uh, bridge builders being the creme de la creme of, of all iron workers. They, they were on this mission, this, this quest to create something extraordinary. So it was very easy to be caught up in the, in, in the, in the spirit, the enthusiasm of that quest. <clears throat> but it was really the quest of, a, of a, an entire community. Uh, the themes <clears throat> um, are things I wrestle with in different ways. I, 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 <clears throat> again, as I've said, I build a common book with, with images, disparate images. The W.O. Mitchell will be filled with images of the prairie, Karalak. Um, I'll be doing a, a deep dive into uh, Saskatchewan art and, and history. So um, that will be, you know, you know a, a thrilling part of the journey as well. Mystery, both pieces are, are you know, uh, rich with mystery. I think who has seen the wind, the title itself is a question. It's a kind of con. It's an unanswerable um, uh, question that is posed. And so I want to honor, uh, I don't want to explain the story uh, or, or, or uh, to, to the spectators that are coming to see the musical. I want to uh, honor the mystery that's, that's um, in, in W.O.'s text, in the story itself. The unanswered questions are, are more important than, than <clears throat> what happens or, or, or the answers to any of those insoluble questions. I, once I've created a, um, a, a longer treatment, um, 10, 12 pages, I start to look at the story from back to front. Uh, there's a wonderful book by David Ball called Backwards and Forwards which describes that dramaturgical process where you, you think uh, experiencing a, a novel or a play from the end to the start is incredibly instructive for a writer or a director or an actor for that matter. So <clears throat> I'll be looking very, very, very closely at, at the shape of the piece, looking for what I identify as, as the, the crisis, the climax, uh, how is, if, if in fact there is a denouement, is it or an epilogue? Is it necessary? Um, where do I know that W.O. was profoundly dissatisfied with where the film ended, and and the ending of this novel, of this to be soon to be a play, uh, is enormously important. Uh, so I'll be uh, looking very very closely at, at W.O.'s uh, the structure uh, for answers to to those questions. And then after we have three years to work on this piece, I'm aiming at May 17th for a, uh, to have a treatment to discuss with the composer. So uh, all this pre-writing, all this common work, book work is going to, will end up uh, you know, contributing to, to, to that process and the creation of a, of a prose treatment of the piece before I've started to, flesh out the scenes or the or decided with Brian where, where the songs live <laughs> uh, <clears throat> or what those lyrics might be. We, <clears throat> we look at the <clears throat> overall structure first. So our, um, I'd like to open, open things up for questions. And just before I, I do that, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but I just wanted to play for you if if I can, the trailer from uh, False Work, which was released about two weeks ago. Let me just see if this works. trying to find it, sorry. So let me know if you can see this. I still see the adaptation, uh, it's like a green. Do you? green sheet with text. Well, there we go.
just gives you a, a, a taste of what um, how it was um, realized, the physical theater elements. So are, are there um, are there questions? Well, I have a question. I'll go first. <laughs> go ahead. Um, just from that video, actually, um, I find it really interesting that you tend to work with a lot of different movement and um, object. And I'm wondering if that's something that you try to use in uh, sort of in form the reader or director or actor about while you're writing or how much you like to give in terms of uh, interpretation, like how prescriptive are you in, in with your writing and stage directions? That's a really good question. The, a lot of the stage directions that were written um, uh, at first reading, which was draft 3.5 or 4, uh, I was very fortunate in, in that um, it was a working uh, rehearsal. Uh, it was a, a, a workshop production. So a lot of the discoveries we made, we didn't, I didn't know we, we were going to use chairs until three weeks in. Um, <clears throat> and so I was working with uh, a physical theater team that, um, and working quite collegially as is my bent. Uh, and so all of these notions would come to the fore through the rehearsal process, which was ridiculously short, like much shorter than it, than it should have been for the, 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 the kind of work we were doing. But that I, what I did benefit from was a, a genuine workshop production where the students were contribu contributing and finding things in our, in our um, exercises and etudes that we could use in the staging. And then I would, I'm gonna, I'll be writing down a lot of those details that aren't in um, draft four. So that was one of the, the unexpected benefits of working with this really, um, diligent group of young actors is that they they really help to to um shape it in a in a, in a physical theater way thank you so all of those things those will be incorporated into the next draft that i'm sharing with gary in in a couple of months anyone else i've had a question yes uh, do you have, if you could pick maybe one pitfall to warn us against when adapting from a novel? Uh, well, I, I, I go back to the, van, van, uh, the van, uh, Bonfire of the Vanities, uh, which is, I think, one of the worst adaptations uh, uh, in all of cinema, in that what they did there was they narrated it to death. Like, if you're going to have a narrator, Make sure that narrator is not stepping on the scenes, not 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 um, uh, interfering with the the flow of of the comedy or the drama. Um, so, and I think also experiments in trying to film the book, you know, say, well, just film the book, just you know, put the book into the screenplay. That it's better, easier said than done, and that is always a mistake that you have to have a strong, some strong ideas about how it needs to shift. I think of uh, Field of Dreams. If you've read um, Shoeless Joe, and then you read uh, the adaptation of it, they're radically different. And yet um, the writer of the, of the book was uh, wildly sad. He was over the moon because he said, you made it into a film. And there, it's not the same event. So there will always be purists, sticklers. We had a couple the other night who, uh, you know, went, you know, uh, stumbling uh, for uh, towards uh, Gary's uh, version of, of false work and saying, where, "Where the hell is it? Where, where's this? This scene's not in the thing." I said, "No, it isn't. I invented the character for the piece, right?" Um, and so Gary gets that as the artist, but some of his friends, who had, you know, this. Oh, uh, 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 an allegiance to the the original piece didn't didn't quite see it that way. So you have to have the the moxie, the bravery to to make changes. It will have to change to become a film, to become a play. It has to change. And most um, 
most artists that I've dealt with from Ursula K. Le Guin to, to um, Gary are only interested in how it works as a play. Mm -hmm. They're, they're far less, um, you know, um, uh, you know, you know, um, they're, they're not easily bruised when, when they see changes. That's been my experience with, with, with uh, good writers. Mm. Yeah. Super. Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, I'll, I have a question. Yes, um, so um, I'll be, I'm taking your workshop coming up in April about oh, the, solo, the solo creative. So obviously that's a different animal. So what, what's the major distinction and difference between adapting a create an already existing work and creating from, from scratch, so to speak? Well, I think th th there's a lot that's similar and a lot that's different. What you're, what you'll be creating in that workshop is a short form event. So like a short story or a poem, it has its own, a, a 10 minute play has its own rules. Um, and those rules can be broken, but there are, there's a reason most successful 10, 10 minutes play, uh, 10 minute plays unfold the way they do. So that and the fact that you're working, um, I don't know, you might be adapting something, you might be working from, you know, might be creating a story from your, um, uh, that is, that is unique to you. You might be working from life experience. I don't know. All what we we spend a lot of our time just trying to figure out what kind uh, what kind of play do you want to write. So mm -hmm. there'll be etudes, exercises where you're just exploring, right? Because I think if we go in, we can go in with all all kinds of fixed notions, and sometimes those fixed notions will be useful. At other times, the the most consistent uh, stumbling block for young writers and new writers is that they try to write try to fit five or six plays into one. They're writing five or six plays, they're not writing a single play. So part of the process is if you if you haven't written or you've wanted to write for a, a long time, that may happen. You try to channel everything into this one event. So <clears throat> questions about whose story is it? Um, what, um, you know, what is stage worthy about this story? Um, how does it hold together as a, you know, how does it move structurally? Um, uh, you know, uh, what, you know, what will help it to gain um, momentum? Um, all of those questions become important um, when, you know, cre creating a new a, a short form piece. You've got no time in a 10 minute play. There's virtually no room for exposition. So you're just, to use Raymond Carver's terms, you're kind of getting in late and, and getting out early. Like, <laughs> Uh, that becomes enormously important. And small casts work, usually work better than big casts in, sh in short form pieces. Does that Thank you. Yeah, matter? that's great. Yep, yep. Thanks, Chantal. Anyone else? You were so thorough and clear <laughs> that, <laughs> that everyone's everyone's got. Uh, I've gotten a lot out of this. Um, incredibly helpful and useful. Um, I think it sounds like uh, like myself. Many people in this room are. Um, well, some people are are fairly experienced writers, and I think many of us are actors and directors and. Um, writing for the first time or, or just very early on in our writing careers. So I personally found this incredibly um, beneficial as, as not just a, a emerging writer, almost writer, <laughs> but um, I, I think also, I, I think the other actors and directors in the room would agree that this is helpful as from that, those perspectives as well, I'm sure, because you're, you seem to approach your work at, uh, sort of from every angle, um, would you say? Um, really understanding what the actor and director need um, as opposed to well my, my I think I was a bit of a, a bit of a grotesque not in that poor theater is is what I love like how, how simply um, and beautifully can you tell the story um, and and also storytelling that puts the onus on the actors to do to do uh, the bulk of the work 
Um, theater as an actor-centered place, not a, not a place of auteurs or, or lighting designers or sound designers. That I think that's really, really important that, that we give the power for the storytelling back to the actors, which is one of the things that I was trying to do uh, with uh, that wonderful group in Victoria. And they, ro they rose to it, that, that we are in, we're moving into a new age, hopefully an age that is less, more, slightly more democratic, um, uh, slightly more open to uh, a collegial uh, uh, approach and sharing power. And that was one of the takeaways <clears throat> or this work on false work, because I got so many great ideas from the team, from the company, uh, that are now incorporated in, in the piece. So it's, uh, it really felt uh, symbiotic, the, the whole process. Lots of give and take. Um, I, are we still doing questions or are we oh, done with It's questions? entirely up to Alana, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, yes. I'll allow it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, Mr. Rose, I'm just wondering if you could talk a bit about, um, you know, adapting something versus creating something yourself, writing something yourself, because mm -hmm. um, like my, in my own experience, I feel, as I said, kind of very inspired by the idea of, adapt of adapting something else and being to the stage. But when it comes to creating my own piece or work like that, um, I, I got nothing. I freeze up, I got nothing. So I'm just kind of interested in the different processes and like, what you think is necessary to kind of do either or what have you or yeah I think I think there are a few like um experts or, or kind of Christopher Hampton is one person I would cite as an uh, example of a, a really fine writer who never writes his own material there's another guy uh, named Shakespeare who same, same deal. He wrote two or three original plays. The rest were improvements on other people's work, right? Which was, you know, that was, that was de rigueur at that time. Everybody did that. But now we, we get so precious about, you know, bringing, for, bring, you know, bringing our own ideas to fruition. We, we ignore all of these possibilities in the world of poetry, or short stories, or um, um, opera, you know, you know, Rent, you know, La Boheme becomes Rent, you know, um, <clears throat> um, Romeo and Juliet becomes West Side Story, that it's going to be a different event. Like, and sometimes uh, if you, you can start with an adaptation and veer off and create something wholly original, having started with that. So I would say if there's a, if there's a story that inspires you, try to adapt it and see where it goes because it might become something um, uh, utterly your own, utterly new. But I think works in the public domain, um, where copyright is not something you have to worry about. That can be tremendously useful. Most of my, I started in the world of adaptation with Shakespeare. I was, I was hired by, by Bard of the Beach to um, create a reading series. And that meant, you know, <clears throat> adapting, you know, plays from the period or, or turning Henry VI into a, you know, a, a two and a half hour event. So I cut my teeth, you know, working um, on new versions of Shakespeare. So. You, I think it's just what's most important is you gravitate towards stuff that you're passionate about. Don't write an adaptation of something you're you're indifferent about. Or if you are indifferent about it, try to you know find a way to fall in love with it, as I had to with um, fantasy fiction and the world of Le Guin. Absolutely, I think I think there's such a like um, prevalence like. Uh, that I feel personally um, in our society that like, you know, if you're not creating your own stuff, then you're not like an artist. But I think that's such a much healthier and vibrant way of interpreting, you know, taking someone else's inspiration and, and making it into this new beautiful thing that people can access is, is way so well, much more inspiring. It's, e it's easy to understand how, why those attitudes exist because um, <laughs> when I reached out to the BC Arts Council and other groups and saying, hey, uh, we just got the uh, you know, rights to, uh, to uh, who has seen the wind. Do you think there's, you know, we could get some seed money? <laughs> the door slammed shut briskly, like, because, oh, you're not writing, you're not creating something from scratch. In other words, there's this kind of a little bit of ascetism when it comes to adaptations. They're considered, you know, kind of subpar or something. But 
you know, there are some of there, this, I can point to, uh, you know, scores of examples of wonderful films, brilliant plays that were not, that were, came from another source that were adaptations. So I, I think that's a kind of a arch attitude that needs to die. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, there's Adam and Zoe. Hello. In the corner there. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I'll ask one. I do have one. Oh, go ahead, Adam. Adam's yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of how to word it. Um, it's so I'm going to be pr uh, probably creating a a solo show in the next year or so. Um, Good for you. And uh, sorry. Good for you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm at Studio 58, so they they make us do that. So I'm excited for it. They but... force you to do that. You don't get out until you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, and so part of uh, my my struggle with uh, uh, creating a solo show is I know I'm talking to the audience. Um, the character is talking to the audience, or uh, figuring out how I'm making it so that they're talking to somebody or they're talking to the audience, but having it also creating action, um, but not have it be exposition all the time. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote a script last semester I was in and I really, really found it challenging to put more words on the page because I didn't have a lot of action going on because it's one person grappling with something, an gotcha. internal struggle. So I wanted to figure out how to make that internal struggle uh, bigger and more out there for something to watch from an audience and to, to have more words to write on yeah. the page without being ex exposition exposition. That's that's a really significant problem for anyone working on a solo piece. My mm -hmm. advice to you um, would be uh, to study the solo form, mm -hmm. which you know go goes all the way back to curtain raisers in Moliere's time, but more recently, Chekhov wrote a whole um, raft of curtain raisers, which are so solo pieces. Right? Mm -hmm. um, look at Spalding Gray's work. Um, look, look at um, Daniel McIver's. I think myself, I prefer his work for one for solo actors over his 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 uh, ensemble pieces. So. I would study that form and say, well, how is the story told? Who is, who is um, you know, that, you know, uh, unfortunate fellow in house talking to? Um, how, does, how, does, how does he um, uh, <clears throat> tell the story? So point of view is one thing, but you have to, you're never ever alone, right? Mm -hmm. not, not, not in a soliloquy by Hamlet, not in, a, not in your own solo piece. So, uh, I'll use Vonnegut's term, pity the spectator, <laughs> pity the audience, right? Keep them in your sights from the beginning of the piece to the end of the piece. It's a conversation. So okay. that that is, I think, the, 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 the niftiest way to kind of step around the, the problem of, of, you know, kind of solipsism or, or kind of wankiness in, in solo, solo pieces. It's that keeping the audience in mind and, and you know, what do you want them to feel? What kind of experience do you want them to have? I think they have to be considered almost from day one. You're not writing a novel. You don't have to worry about that. Well, you have to pity the reader perhaps, but uh, that's, that's a slightly different game. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I would just look <clears throat> at some of those examples mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that I've given you. There's a wonderful writer, writer Debbie Tucker Green, a British uh, writer, actor, <clears throat> um, who writes in a, you know, this really uh, wild hip hop style. And she, she writes for one voice, uh, 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 two of her, la her last places are for one, one actor. And you also start to look at how writers change guises because in some solo pieces, we're meeting, you know, like Lily Tallman, the search for intelligent life, we're meeting 20 people, right? We're meeting a whole cast of characters uh, evoked by one actor. So mm. the sky's the limit. It all depends on what kind of story you want to tell. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That. Is that helpful? Thank you. Yeah, no, that's helpful for sure. Thank Great. you. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah. 
We are almost at time. Cool. Um, so maybe uh, one final question or, or words of advice for us all, perhaps. Um, I know you, you often mention <laughs> compassion when you're working with us actors. Um, while we're writing, do you have any tips on exercising some self-compassion as we're going through the process, which can sometimes be very uh, difficult? Well, I think it's an excellent question, Ilana. I think, I think my advice for the writer is very similar to my advice, for, my advice for the actor in the early rehearsal, that everything you're offering is perfect. Now, what do you want to change? Everything is perfect. So uh, John Lazarus once said to me that he, he never throws away a single page. It doesn't matter how, what dreck he's written that day. He holds on to it until he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt it's not going to be useful in the piece. Because <clears throat> while we're writing it, we can't, we're, we're not very good judges. And, and self-loathing being what it is and the actor, writer, the theater creature being, you know, who she is, who he is, we, we deal with, you know, anxiety, self-loathing all the time. So, you know, affording yourself the same compassion that you, you know, give others in a rehearsal uh, setting, that would be my advice. That this piece that was written that is less than perfect is the work of your favorite writer. That favorite writer is you, right? So you have to, that, that needs to, that's the mindset that's needed for that or else you know you you will be tearing a lot up a lot of paper and and staring at a lot of blank pages and that's agony right natalie goldberg which uh, read most of her books she's a wonderful writing coach and she talks about keeping the pay the fingers moving across the page i mean if you're Working with a laptop, keep the fingers tapping. If you're working cursively, keep your finger, your your hand moving across the page. Uh, keep, you know, just free writing. Streaming is enormously useful in the early going. Giving yourself permission just to write anything uh, can be a great start. So quantity over quality. And I think that that's, uh, because the only thing that distinguishes a, a, a writer from a non-writer is writing. It's, it's the actual act of putting pen to paper, fingers to keyboard. And that, now that I have this abundance of spare time, I'm finding that the blocks I dealt with as a younger man are, are less uh, insurmountable than they were. So I think it's a great antidote for the anxiety that we're all feeling right now is, is putting, channeling that energy into, into work, into something that, something beautiful that you've created with your own hand. Well, I think that is a perfect note to end the evening on. Um, I would like to thank you, Christopher, for spending your time with us and sharing all of your knowledge. Um, and I want to thank everybody who is here. Some people did have to leave early, but the recording will be available for them. So mm -hmm. if anyone wants to revisit this recording um, again, uh, it'll be on the RCA's YouTube uh, page at some point. Um, but uh, it, this was just great to be in this space with you. And, and uh, I know we're all <laughs> really missing uh, the rehearsal space and being together. So this is the next best thing. So we're it is, it is the next best them. thing. Yeah. yeah. And thank you so much for the opportunity, Alana, and, and all of you. It was, yeah. it was, it was great to, uh, to meet this way. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you so awesome. much, Christopher. That was so inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I hope I hope so. Wonderful. I hope so. Oh. I hope. Yeah. Six. Mesmerizing. It was great. Yeah. Thanks, Christopher. <laughs> yeah. But well, I'm, I'm I'm glad. And thank you so much for your wonderful questions. And I look forward to meeting you all in in, in the flesh uh, sometime in the near future. <laughs> Definitely. Take care.